Okay, so I'm Rob Heinemann. I'm a professor at Monash Business School. You may know me as the author of the forecast package if you're an R user that does forecasting. Hey, I'm Mitch. I've spent the good part of the last year working on this Fable package and also extending the forecast package. So I hope you like what you've seen. And wow, what a great audience to know. So thank you all for making your way out here. Slides are also available. You can check them on Twitter. Yeah, there's like the tweeting encouraged. There's the Twitter handles, there's the slide address. Great. So there's a reason why we need to update our tools. The forecast package is reaching its uh, limits in terms of the data that we're encountering in daily use. So it's evident that time series data is changing because we're changing the way we collect the data. There's more sensors and there's more need for up to the minute information relating to time. And with this greater detail that we're observing, instead of getting monthly data, annual data or quarterly data, we're now observing hourly or sub-hourly data that reveals even more patterns and causes more problems for us when we want to forecast it. So some such patterns that we have, we often see multiple seasonality. There's human behavior within a day, maybe across the week when people go to work or not. And we often have more than just one variable. So we observe lots of things and at that lower level, we run into more problems such as seeing more noise and having more missing values as well. So we need some new tools to be able to deal with these new forecasting challenges. So we could have extended the forecast package, but there's about a million downloads a year for the forecast package and that's a lot of users to upset if we start changing things drastically and I can't deal with all the emails. So we thought, well, let's do something else. Um, leave the forecast package where it is. People can keep using it if they like using TS objects. But for a lot of users uh, who are used to dealing with data in data frames or in tibbles, uh, we'll build tools in for that audience. So we're going to talk about three packages, uh, mostly about the Fable package, but there's a series of three packages here. The Tibble package, which is time series tibbles. So everyone know what a tibble is? Okay, so in the tidyverse way of doing things, it's like a data frame. Um, so time series tibbles are in the tibble package. The author of the tibble package, the primary author, is Ira Wang, who's here. <laughs> um, so she's been working on that as part of her PhD project. The fable package is the forecasting part of the suite of packages we're developing. So we, you, your data is in a, a tibble, which is a time series tibble, and then you will use fable to do the forecasting. And then FASTER is an extension of Fable. It's, it's just demonstrating how it can be extended because we're trying to make it as extensible as possible. And Mitch is the sole author of the FASTER package and he's, he's the primary author of the Fable package. So hopefully by the end of the day, you'll be well acquainted with these three packages and be comfortable to try out some tidy forecasting in R. So first up, we have the Sybil package and we could have written the whole talk just on this package. And in fact, Eero has written several talks about it. Uh, they're available linked at the bottom here. There's plenty of resources available. Uh, but Sybil forms the basic data set that we're going to use for forecasting. And a couple of example data sets we're going to use today is Australian retail data. This is from the Bureau of Statistics. And in this data set, we have monthly data. You can see the month up the top here. And there's 152 unique series represented here. So these are identified by state and by industry. So we have all of the states and territories of Australia and a, a collection of different industries, giving us many series uh, of turnover data to predict. So that's what we're going to look at, but that's a bit hard to start with. So we're going to zoom in and focus on just one series. Uh, we like our coffee, we like our eating out, our restaurants. So we're going to look at Victorian cafe restaurant turnover. And it looks a bit like this. Rob, do you want to say a bit about yep. this? Series? So this is very standard um, tidyverse style of working. You take your data, you pass it as using the pipe through to a filter function, and then you can filter which parts of that data set you want. And that creates a, a, a tibble as well, um, but it's just that one, one series. So this is Victorian Cafe Restaurant and Takeaway Turnover. You can see that it's trended, it's seasonal, the seasonality is changing, the variation is increasing an interesting series to try to forecast. And if you've done some, some time series before, you'll see that the seasonal pattern here is somewhat multiplicative, and we'll have to consider that when we make our models uh, in future slides. Another example that we'll be doing is half-hourly electricity data. This is a little bit more practical or realistic uh, because 
as I mentioned, monthly data is getting less common and we're starting to see half hourly electricity data and other more regular series. This one also has more information. It's got work day, if it was a working or not working day, and also the temperature at that half hour. So a very rich data set that's going to have a lot of challenging uh, features. So if we just took the monthly electricity demand data, uh, so this, uh, it would look like that. Um, so it's you know, pretty coarse data. There's not a lot of forecasting you can do there. So that's the same level of detail that we had in the retail example. And then we can uh, look at it at a finer level of temporal disaggregation. Move to daily data, it looks like that. And you can see things like the you know, extreme demand days when it was really hot in January 2014. You can see the winter peak with heating. Um, the, the troughs tend to happen in the autumn and the spring when there's not really enough much heating and much cooling. Um, so we see more structure here. Um, earlier we saw the seasonal pattern for summer and winter using more electricity to maintain temperature of your home or business. And here we also see a weekday, a working day and not working day pattern as it keeps going up and down. So there's already two types of seasonal patterns that we're working at. However, it doesn't stop there. We've actually got half hourly data and it very quickly looks like a mess and we can't see much other than the annual maybe increase in winter. So we need to take a closer look. Okay, so zooming in on just a few weeks um, here. So this is four, just over four weeks of data and you can see there's a weekly pattern, there's a daily pattern and the, the annual pattern as before. So three types of seasonality. This is very common in sort of time series around energy and, and any kind of human use data which is recorded at a sub-daily level. The forecast package is particularly bad at handling this type of data. Um, so it was designed for annual, monthly, quarterly data. You can sort of coerce it into doing a few other things, but it's not really set up for that. Great, so that's our two data sets that we'll look at, uh, mostly for this talk. Uh, let's move on to the good stuff. Let's see some Fable in action. So Fable is a re-implementation of the forecast package. It's meant to work well with the tidyverse uh, and make it more natural to work with your time series objects. And I don't want to say too much about it here because that would be summarizing the entire talk, so let's just go straight into it. The first thing that we need to start with is a model. You can't produce forecasts without some sort of model driving it. And all models in Fable uh, use a consistent interface. So you use the name of the model that you're going to estimate as in, the function. In uppercase. All in uppercase um, to avoid name conflicts between forecast and fable. And they all expect as first input at Sybil. So that's our tidy time series Tibble. And secondly, we'll want a model formula. And this will be our compact representation of the model itself. So how do we specify the model? One of the things we wanted to do with this is to make it much more consistent than the forecast package. The forecast package has a whole bunch of forecasting functions. It's not too inconsistent, but some of them have formulas, some of them use other ways of interfacing with it. Um, the output from it is every model has a different sort of looking output. So we're trying to make it much more consistent uh, and therefore hopefully more e easier for users. So here's, here's the formula interface. Um, so if you're used to the LM function or, or other similar functions, it looks pretty much the same. You can uh, have your response variable on the left-hand side and a bunch of stuff on the right-hand side specifying the model. So here's an example. You might transform the data, um, say using a log or um, something like that. And then on the right-hand side, you've got things about the, um, the model, whether you want a trend in it or seasonality, what type of seasonality. Um, so we'll show you some examples to how this works. Uh, the nice thing about the transformations is that back transformation is automatic. You can put any transformation you like in there um, and make your own one up and it will still know how to back transform it. So let's see it in action. Let's fit a basic model. So has anyone heard of an exponential smoothing model? A bit of forecasting experience? You have, definitely. Great. Uh, so exponential smoothing is a type of time series model for state space and it allows it to update over time. Uh, we're going to go less about the details. You can read the textbook uh, for forecasting principle practices for more detail. But uh, we'll compare the interface between the two models in Fable and in Forecast. 
So in Fable, we have our left-hand side being our turnover variable, that's our response, and we're predicting it using multiplicative seasonality. Remember how we saw the plot and I said, I'm pretty sure there's multiplicative seasonality? So I'm forcing it to use multiplicative seasonality here. I also haven't specified my error and my trend special variables, and that means they'll be automatically selected for you. So if you ignore a special, it's automatically selected. And you can see that the model that has been specified has multiplicative error, additive damped trend, which has automatically been selected, and multiplicative seasonality. Comparing that with the forecast package, the main trouble here is just creating the time series object. You need to look into the object and work out the starting date, which is expressed as a uh, numeric. So it's not a very natural format if you're downloading or importing data that already has a date column in it. And the interface for forecast is not using formulas. So it's just using arguments. And Z indicates choose it for me. And the M in the third position is for seasonality. But the results are the same. It's picked the same model for us. A little bit more complicated. Here's a log transformation. So that's automatically back transformed. And the equivalent in forecast is specifying a box cox transformation. Forecast can only do box cox transformations. But as we mentioned, Fable can do any type of transformation. And if you're familiar with box cox, lambda equals zero is equivalent to a log. But if you were doing count data with zeros and you try to log plus one, not possible in forecast. Um, the back transformation won't be automatic but in Fable it can handle it, no problems. Um, probably should have explained the name Fable early on, we missed that bit. Um, so, you know, a Fable is a story that tells you something about the reality. It's not true, but it's helpful in understanding the truth. And that's what a forecast is. A forecast is never the truth, but it's helpful in understanding what's going on in reality. So that's why we call it Fable. It also stands for forecasting tables. Um, because that's what we're doing, we're taking tables and we're forecasting with them and the output is also a forecasted table. So the out, um, we'll talk about Fable objects later, but you'll notice that this is a Mabel object, um, which is a model table. Um, so it comes back, because there's only one series here, it comes back with a one line table. Later we'll show you examples where there's lots of series and we'll come back with lots of different models for all the different series. No spoilers. <laughs> So let's try to make a more complicated model. Let's go back to our electricity example. Uh, this data set also has exogenous information. So we had the work day and the temperature details. And this is what it looks like as expected. When temperature is low, we have much higher electricity demand. And also when uh, there's a peak in temperature, such as a heat wave in 2014, we have a lot of people cooling their homes as well. So a big peak there. So we want to use temperature as a relationship non-linearly to fit our model. To do this, we need to use an ARIMA model because exponential smoothing can't include exogenous regressors. And the model that we've specified here has a linear workday effect, temperature, and temperature squared. And then I've also included an ARIMA specification. So this is giving us a dynamic regression with ARIMA errors, but a linear model with uh, ARIMA errors. The interface with forecast gets a little bit trouble, troublesome when you're working with XREGs because it expects everything in matrices. It's not that tidy Sybil or data frame format. Um, so you'll need to bind together the columns and calculate the square. It's just getting a little bit ugly when we get into that territory. Also notice that when we filter our data a little bit, we come up with that magic number 2832. That just happens to be the index that corresponds to this year, um, this day. Uh, it's much more natural to specify in terms of dates rather than these indices. So we're good points for Fable at the moment. Uh, you'll also notice in the output, because we've got a one row model summary in our table, we're missing out on some important details from our model. So our forecast model says some of the coefficients, some other useful information, maybe a little bit about how the model is fit. But our model for Fable is so, um, sadly making, missing that at the moment. So we want to know how to extract those components. And to do that, we lend on a bit of help from the Broom package. If you've used uh, the Broom package, it's for tidy extraction of model components. And we also introduce our own generic called components, which is specific to time series for extracting features of interest, such as the seasonal component, the trend component, and so on. We'll see that soon. OK, so here we apply the augment function, um, which is 
Okay. If you've used Broom before, you'll be familiar with it. It takes a model and it adds things about the model to your data set. So in this case, we're augmenting the um, ETS model that was fitted to the CAFE data, and it's come back with the, a similar looking table, but with some extra columns, fitted values and residuals. And if you apply tidy to it, again, borrowing directly from the way the Broom package works, um, it'll give you back a tibble with um, model parameters in it. So there's a couple of extra columns there. The, the term column tells you what the parameter was and the estimate is the numerical value of it. So the glance uh, function is a useful function to compare models or get a one row summary. Often when you're comparing two ARIMA specifications, you want to choose one with lowest AIC if they've got the same response, and you'd use the glance function to extract those details. And lastly, we have our own generic, our own broom-like generic for components. Because we've fit an ETS model, it's kind of built up on these states for level, trend, and uh, or slope, and season. So these provide some useful information that's interesting to us, and it's especially valuable when we visualize it. So here's some quick little ggplot code. So all these functions will work very well with the tidyverse, um, naturally extending to ggplot, dplyr, and so on. And we can see our level is increasing over time. That's something we saw in our time series. And our seasonality is very constant as well. And lastly, our slope, sometimes it's going up and down. Um, at times it's negative, but most of the time it's growing. Now that we've got our model, we've seen how to extract the components, how do we actually produce our forecast with it? So like uh, the forecast package and like the predict function, first thing we provide it is our model, and then we also need to provide either some future data, including our X-regs, so uh, if we knew what a workday or non-working day was in the future, uh, we'd provide that, or if it doesn't include any exogenous regresses, uh, we can just specify H, and that will automatically set up the new data to be the future by the number of H steps ahead. So that's a convenient way to do it, but it's a little less flexible. OK, so here we take our fitted model, Fable Cafe Fit, type it to the forecast function. We say we want 24 steps ahead. So this is very familiar to you if you've used the forecast package. And we save the result and the object Fable Cafe FC. And you can see that it's come back with a object which is uh, in the same table structure as the data, where you've got um, one row for each month. The forecast is in the column headed turnover, because that's the same name of the variable that was original in the original thing. But the Fable package is, handles forecasting quite differently from the forecast package, because it returns a whole distribution. So not only a point forecast, but a distributional forecast. And that was one of the things you wanted to do here, is to move people away from just looking at point forecast or point forecast plus, say, an 80% or an 95% interval and um, provide the whole distribution. You can still get the interval, as we'll show you later, um, but understand that the uh, uh, forecasting really is about estimating future distributions, and so we just provide them directly in that column. There. And this also allows us the flexibility to do, calculate some more accuracy measures, do some more flexible plots, because before in the forecast package, you make a um, forecast, get the 80% interval, and if you wanted a different interval, well, too bad. You have to estimate the forecast again, whereas storing the distribution allows us to calculate them on the fly. And we can't show some forecasts without seeing a plot of them, so they look reasonable. And you can see the plots are the same as in the forecast package. It produces the 80% and 95% intervals on the fly so that you can plot them. Um, but it's actually, what's stored is actually the whole distribution, not just those intervals. So for our electricity demand, it's a little bit more complicated to forecast, but not by much, just because we're using the exogenous regressors. So we need to provide the future temperature information and also the future workday, non-working day data. So I've got this Sybil Elec New that I've created. This is just filtering some part of the example data set. And I'm passing that to the forecast function as my new data. So that's where it'll be able to match up the time, find the right details for the column, and use it appropriately, calculating the squared if needed. Whereas for the forecast package, you again need to calculate it yourself. And it's actually very picky. If you calculate it in a different way and it has different columns, it won't accept it at all. Uh, so having to create the x regs yourself is a little bit painful. And note again the magic numbers to extract the right period of the data. I actually made a mistake when preparing this slide earlier. Um, 
So be very careful if you're using the forecast package, but the Fable will handle it for you. One other thing on that slide is when you're working with half hourly data or any kind of sub daily data, um, the forecast package treats time as a numerical value. And so if you look up down the bottom there, the time associated with each forecast is giving is, an, is a number, 60 point something or other, which is not intuitive. Like what does that, what date or, or half hour does that refer to? It's, it's number of weeks since the start of the data. So the 60 point something or other is counting half hours in, in units of weeks, uh, which is extremely unintuitive. Um, but because the forecast package uses a numerical value for time, you have to do that. Whereas in the Fable package, we're freed up from that. We can use whatever we like. And so we're using a timestamp, so it's much more intuitive. You can see precisely what time each forecast corresponds to. And here's the forecasts. So the forecasts for this ARIMA model, they look OK. Um, they're not able to capture all of the structure, like the changing uh, weekday, week, uh, weekend effect. And we'll see an advanced model to capture that later. So we've produced our forecasts. Can we trust them? Are they any good? Let's see some accuracy. So to calculate accuracy, similar to the forecast package and any other tools that you've used before, uh, you can provide either a model, a Mabel, or a forecast, a Fable, with, either, um, with your selection of measures. So this is different. Uh, you can now specify and remove some measures. If you don't want to calculate RMSE, for example, you don't have to. And if you have your own measure that you use in your company or uh, that you've made yourself, you're free to include that as a function input to this. So it's much more flexible than before. And for the forecasts, uh, the forecast accuracy function doesn't know the future, so you'll need to provide that. That's where the new data will come in. So our simple example. Yep, so we just pass the forecast, or this has the model object to the accuracy function. So it doesn't know the future, it can only look at the training set accuracy, the fitting accuracy, and it comes back with a, uh, a row of measures similar to what you would get in the forecast package. But it's in the form of a tibble rather than in the form of a matrix here. And then the equivalent thing from the forecast package. So another difference here is you'll notice the context information. The Fable package is storing onto the keys that existed in the original data set. So we have a bit more information to know that this is actually Victoria and it's the cafe data rather than the um, blank detail from the forecast package. And then if you pass it some new data, then it will be able to do the test accuracy as, in, as distinct from the training, <coughs> the training accuracy. <coughs> the forecast package did them both uh, together, but we've separated it out so that you get either the test accuracy or the training accuracy. And also note that the data we pass into forecast has to be the response, whereas for the Fable package, if you just provide a Sybil, it'll go and find the right variable that you want to compare against and match up the times as well. So it's a little bit safer to provide new data just as a Sybil. Um, you just let Fable do more work and then it's less error prone to mistakes. Now there's a reason why Fable is called Fable and I'm sure you've all anticipated this moment coming. It's all about forecasting with tables. It's a little bit odd to have a model uh, in a table form with just one row. There's, we've got this whole table structure with one model. Why not just expand it? Well, our data had 152 separate time series. We really want to see how we can model all of these uh, using Fable, right? Well, we can do exactly that. And it works out to be a little bit easier than what we did earlier. Earlier, we had to filter out a single series to model it. But if you just pass the full data set, all series and everything into the model function, here I've specified no model specification because I want it to automatically select everything. It will go away and fit 152 separate models and summarize them into this table format. And you'll notice that the model is slightly different for the ACT cafe and catering services. It's chosen additive seasonality, but most uh, seasonal patterns is multiplicative for the ACT. So this saves an enormous amount. You fit 152 models with just one line of code. And all of the functions work like that. You can take any function and say, here's my data set, give me some models, and it'll just go and do it. And this works with all the extra functions as well. Extract components. Uh, let's augment it. You'll notice that it's now got 152 separate series in here, ready for plotting and comparison. Same for tidying. Uh, we don't have a summary here, uh, but if you grouped by them, uh, you'll see that there's 152 series, all with their terms and estimates. 
Same for glancing. Here's a nice way to see um, like standard deviation across models and the model that was specified in a tabular format. And I really like the components element when we throw in this extra dimension of multiple models because there's some useful things that you can gain from the level uh, of the ETS model. So for example, if we wanted to look at the CAFE data set, but compared how Victoria is faring against all the other states and territories, um, it's common to want to de-seasonalize or just look at the overall level of the series. So extracting the level state allows us to see that New South Wales expends more on their CAFE and eating out um, than Victoria. Uh, without getting seasonality in the way. So it's a nicer representation of that. Okay, so here's passing that collection of models, all 152 models to the forecast function, and it goes away and generates the forecast for all of those models, returns them in a fable um, with um, a forecast for all of the different time periods ahead and all of the different combinations of state and industry. And if you don't believe us, there's the proof. <laughs> you can't really see much in this plot, but I think it's nice to just, it's there. It did 152 series and it forecasted them all. If you look particularly close, you might see the tiny little intervals in each of those little facets. But don't strain your eyes. We've picked out our one we care about, the cafe example. And you can see there's some nice separation in the intervals here and all the forecasts look reasonable for these uh, separate series. This is really just a very few lines of code um, because of the way it's being structured. Okay, We're applying the accuracy function to those um, models, we get all the different accuracies. So you can compare MAPES, for example, across states and so on, um, and across industry. So for this accuracy, it's especially important to compare scale-independent measures. So you might only want to compare MAPE, uh, MACE, mean percentage error, um, this absolute percentage error that is, and scaled error, that one is, if you're unfamiliar, um, because it doesn't make much sense to compare mean error if they're on different scales. Uh, so using the measures argument for accuracy, you could select only the ones you care about. Maybe we should have done that here. Okay, so um, Fable is really designed to make your life easy when you're doing lots of forecasting and you work with the tidyverse. It's also designed to be extended. Um, so we, you know, I'm only one person and I have a few assistants like Mitch and Eero that help me do development, but we can't do everything. So we thought, well, let's try and make it much more extensible in the forecast package so people can write their own extensions for their own different modeling functions and hopefully make it easier for everyone else to do forecasting in whatever way they want to do it. So we've really built an ecosystem here where a model developer doesn't need to write all their plotting code, doesn't need to introduce this formula interface or the uh, transformation with automatic back transformation. You can just let Fable or Fable Lite, which is a small, smaller version of the package, handle all of those steps. And so that allows you to focus on your model itself and the forecasting methods that you'll be writing. And you get all of the extra stuff for free. Uh, you can also extend it to do new transformations. So you can define your own transformation. Uh, and provide new accuracy measures. So we anticipate providing a, new ex a few extra packages that are specialized to do these tasks. So this is my part. My faster model is the first extension to the Fable ecosystem, and it's a model extension. So this model is designed to uh, capture switching patterns in time. So we saw how the pattern for electricity demand was different depending on if it was a weekday or a weekend. So it drops and it has a slightly different peak at the start of the day. Let's make that a bit clearer. So in orange we've got our working days, demand is substantially higher, and on non-working days in green, uh, the pattern is slightly different. Not just because it's lower, but the seasonal pattern is different too. You'll see that the peak at the start of the series is slightly smaller than what you'll see at the, at the starting peak in working days. And that's probably because people don't have to get up right at the same time. They can lay in bed for a bit longer, uh, start their day a little later. So to produce a model with Fable, uh, with Faster, we leverage a lot of the features from Fable. It's the same interface where you provide a Sybil and a formula. And on the left-hand side, I've decided to forecast demand using a log transformation, taking advantage of the automatic back transformation. 
And my model includes trigonometric seasonal terms, like Fourier terms, if you've heard of them before. That captures my daily pattern. And then I've also got an extra level here. And that'll capture the change in the level between working days and not working days. And the important part uh, that FASTER introduces is this switching term. So for each workday, that model in the brackets will switch. So it'll have a different seasonal day pattern and a different level every working day and not working day. And lastly, I've thrown in an extra couple of exogenous regressors for good measure, because we know temperature has a role to play. And once we've done our model, we're back in the consistent fable world. So I've got my Mabel uh, as returned, and it's telling me I've fitted a faster model. And with that, I can forecast. Because I'm using exogenous regressors for workday and temperature, I provide the new data, and I get my fable ready for further analysis and plotting and you don't need to learn any extra tools because you've, if you've learned one model and how to do your forecasts and plots and so on, uh, just adding this new model, you'll use all of those same uh, knowledge to make the analysis. So just notice there the distributions. Because Mitch used a log transformation, when it does the back transformation, it's now a transform normal. It's, because it's a, log, a normal on the log space and then it back transforms it. That's all taken care of and it just says T bracket M, meaning transform normal distribution. And there's our plots. So now you can see that it's capturing a little bit more variability, where the ARIMA forecast was a constant seasonal pattern. Now it's a lower seasonal pattern for non-working days and a larger or higher level seasonal pattern that's slightly different for, non for working days. So what's coming up next? We've got a big plans for the package, and here's a small peek into the future of Fable. So this is the stuff that's not fully developed yet. Some of it's mostly done, some of it's not done at all. So one thing we'd like to do is you've fitted a model and you want to simulate the future. So not only generate forecasts and intervals and distributions, but simulate what might happen. Um, that can often get used in analysis where you say, well, let's, let's run a simulation um, of what could happen and feed that into some um, an analysis. So the simulate function will do that. It'll take a, a Mabel and it'll simulate futures, um, lots of different possible futures. So if you've tried to do the simulating before, you might have had some trouble. And we tried to keep the interface here as simple as possible. We're uh, simulating 24 steps ahead in time. Our horizon is 24. And we're simulating it five times. And that'll return at Sybil, ready for <laughs> plotting. So our plot code is actually really simple. And there we've got our five simulated futures. Another feature we are, well, I'm particularly very excited about, and Nick, if Nick was in the audience, Nick Tierney, his uh, for Narnia, he would be so excited for this, interpolating missing values. I find this especially important for modern time series because we're observing things more frequently. There's a higher chance that something's going to go wrong, say, for a day. Maybe your sensor ran out of battery. Or um, this is less common if you're looking at, at uh, retail um, turnover because you're going to report that information. So as we observe things from sensors and more regularly, we run into missing values all the time. Uh, this example is not half hourly. It's not one of those types of time series. It's four yearly. So uh, this is the Olympics, and this is the running times in the athletics races. So we've got men and women, 100 meters up to 10,000 meters. And you'll notice a couple of gaps, specifically this one in 1916 and a couple around 1940. The Olympics weren't ran during the World Wars, so we don't know uh, what the running times would have been for those races. Let's try to predict them. Okay, so we take the, the data, we fit a model, which is a um, linear model, just with a time trend in it. So TSLM does a time series linear model, and the running time in the time va um, variable is just modeled as a trend. So just tilde trend, and then um, we want to interpolate it, so we um, then pass it to the interpolate function, like that. So you can now see in 1916, our missing value has been interpolated to be 10.8. And in the plot, we see some dashed lines that I've added in to indicate that all these missing values have now been guessed using a model-based uh, interpolation, which isn't very common in the cross-sectional world, let alone the forecasting world. So you can substitute the time series linear model with whatever model. You could use FASTER, you could use ETS, and it will interpolate that for you. A couple of other functions which we uh, haven't yet implemented, but we um, are planning on this, is a refit function where you've taken an existing model that you fitted the one data set you want to 
apply exactly the same model to a new data set without re-estimating the parameters. You want to use that model on the new data. And refit will do that. Um, and stream is where you take a model and uh, you've got data arriving all the time in a streaming process and you want to update your model based on the new information. So refit's in very early stages, but I've got an example for streaming. Uh, so say our faster model had these forecasts and two weeks later, it may have taken a little while to estimate the model, go through all of history, but now two weeks later our model's invalid. We've got new data, we need to update our model. Rather than training the entire model again, it would be nice just to add on that extra two weeks and slightly adjust the model. And that's exactly what Stream does. So we've taken our forecasts, we've observed a new bit of data, this in orange, and now using the Stream function, providing it our new data set, it will extend the forecast horizon so that we can now predict further with an updated model. And you can re-estimate or not depending on your speed preferences. So the faster model is particularly designed for this use case. Some of the other models um, are going to be a little harder to work with in the stream, but we want eventually to be able to do this for any model. A couple more things. Decomposition forecasting is something that you can do in the forecast package, uh, but you can only do STL decomposition forecasting. So here we take a time series, we extract out the trend, the seasonality, and what's left over, the errors, and then we forecast them separately. So you might forecast seasonality on its own using seasonal naive. You might forecast the trend with the remainder using ETS or whatever you choose. That's, a, that's possible in forecast, but there's work underway to do it in Fable. Sybil Stats does... This is basically the STLF function from the forecast yeah. package, but we're doing it in a more sort of decomposed way so that you can um, use other variations of it more easily. So we've fitted our STL. Again, this uses Fable, so we can do a log transformation and it will know how to deal with that. Uh, I've done logs because it's multiplicative seasonality and STL is additive. And I extract my components and the, the object the dable, or the dabble, uh, knows how to recombine the components into the original series, which is essential to make your end forecasts. So the idea is you forecast them separately and then combine them with whatever rule is specified. So that's what the decomposition for the series looks like. We get our trend, our seasonality, and the yucky stuff. Oops. There we go. So, um, once we've got distributions, we should start thinking about, well, how, how do we know if it's a good distribution? Or how do you know if it's a good prediction interval? So everyone's used to doing MAPES for point forecast accuracy. Um, but there are actually measures for deciding whether an interval is, a good, is, a, is an accurate interval or not, or whether a whole distribution is a good representation of the reality or not. And so we're going to put this into the package. Um, so Winkler's score, there should be an L in there, Winkler's score um, from Robert Winkler came up with this idea of measuring how good an interval is, basically by taking the, the length of the interval, um, and so the narrower the better, but then penalising if your actual observation is outside the interval. Um, and the penalty is chosen based on how, what coverage the interval should have. And then another idea is, um, which is used in distributional forecasting is to use percentile scoring, uh, where you um, your forecast will consist of a whole lot of quantiles, for example, from the distribution, and then you um, score the what actually happens um, based on all the different quantiles that are provided. So that's been used in energy forecasting competitions, and we're going to put it into the package so it's very easy for anyone to do it. So at the moment, these are not widely used um, in the sort of business forecasting world, but we figure if we put them in and encourage people to you know, to actually assess their intervals and assess their distributions. These are the simplest two scoring methods that we know of for interval and distribution scoring. So hopefully people will be able to um, you know, be a little more sophisticated in the way they do forecasting. And adding them in should be just as natural as your point forecasting measures. Uh, here I've just decided to change my measures for my accuracy function and selected on a couple of new measures, measures for Winkler score and percentile score. And the idea is maybe we'll bring some of these as defaults in the future. And you get your output for the test set. Last bit of extensions for Fable. Well, we need more models. Currently, we've got some lag walks, so your random walks, your seasonal naive naive. Uh, we've also got time series linear model that we showed, and ETS and ARIMA. 
but there's plans for a whole host of more models. Uh, so if you're familiar with some of those on there, um, they're coming to Fable uh, soon. <laughs> Essentially everything in the forecast package will end up a version of it in the Fable package, we just haven't implemented everything yet. And then there's plans to add some more that aren't in the forecast package, so we're extending it even further. And that might be where uh, extension packages come in as well. Thank you, everyone. That's the news for Fable. So you can, find, you can get these packages by going to tidyverts.org. So that's the tidy version of time series. Um, and that will just redirect you to the GitHub site where all of the packages are housed. Um, of the packages we've developed, there's one on Crayon at the moment, which is the Sybil package. Everything else is just on GitHub. So we're hoping to have a Crayon release in the next couple of months. Wow. <laughs>